Ha! <laughs> Oh, how's everybody doing this evening? Good, good. Loving this weather. Loving this weather. We had some nice weather last night, night before. I think it's supposed to be a little warmer tonight, but it's still, it's pretty. Uh, when's the rain coming? Anybody know? Yeah, that's what I thought. Tomorrow, and here it comes. Yeah, well, I was thinking about washing mine today, so make sure it rain. Yeah, <laughs> I got to get out in that garden and pick squash. I mean, you know, we got a hundred squash plants, so we've got to get there. Right there. No, there's not hardly a hundred, but well, there's a whole lot more than two out there in that garden. <laughs> That's all right. Marie, Marie was going to go pick it today, and we ended up with grandbabies all day. Or she ended up with, I'm going to re- rephrase, she ended up with grandbabies all day. Uh, we are going to be looking, uh, beginning there in Colossians chapter 1, if you don't be turning over there. Before we get started uh, in our class this evening, let's have a word of prayer. Almighty God, Father in heaven, Lord God, holy is your name. Lord, we thank you so much for all you've done for us in this life. We thank you for your son that you have sent to die for us so that we can have that opportunity to be at home in heaven with you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities that you have given us to serve you, to do your will in this life, be able to spread your gospel and to help others. Help us in those efforts that we will continue to do well in those and Where we are lacking in those, please help us to strengthen those points. Be with us in our class this evening that we will will get from your word what we need to motivate us to do your will. Lord, please be with those who are unable to be with us here this evening due to illness or or whatever it may be, that you'll look down on them and help them to be with us again. Lord, please forgive us of our sins and our lives that we do commit every day. Lord, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Every citizen of the kingdom has a privilege to serve. Now, you might have put a number of different words in that blank, but I want us to look at this as a privilege. And I appreciate, I appreciated from the first time that we began uh, being with you here at Lawnville Road that the, the, the sheep that we that sent out is privileged to serve. Because that's what it is. It is a privilege to serve. And it is a privilege that is not set aside for specific members of the Lord's church. It is a privilege that is to all those in the kingdom. If you look in Colossians 1... Verses 12 and 13, he says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Now, you don't see this in the English, but in the Greek, all of that's one sentence. Matter of fact, that sentence begins, uh, I believe, back in verse 9. And that sentence continues to flow on through. I don't remember exactly where it ends there. But, uh, but that's all one sentence. And the he there really is who. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. The idea though there is, is where it says he's qualified us to be partakers. Do, do any of your versions have something besides partakers there? Okay, sharing in the inheritance. And that's what the idea behind partaking is. You are sharing in that. You have all things in common in that. You're participating in those things. Uh, But it's the idea that we can all, through the qualification that the, the Father has given us, we can all serve. You know, you go into the New Testament, or the Old Testament, and not everybody was allowed to serve. You know, it was only the Levites who were allowed to serve before the Lord. And then even in that, then you had the, the descendants of Aaron could only be the priests. You know? And so they, they were only a few that were selected out of God's people who were able to do that. 
But under the New Testament, under the new law, all Christians have the privilege to serve. When we are transferred into the kingdom, we each are sharing in the inheritance of that kingdom, the inheritance of light, the the kingdom where we can serve God. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 20 in verse 1. Matthew 20 in verse 1. I'm just going to read the the first couple of verses there. It says, "For Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And you go on down through there, and, you know, different times of the day he would go out and he would hire more and more laborers. But the idea is there in verse 1, the kingdom of heaven is like. And the idea is there is work to be done, and he and the landowner is hiring workers to come out and work in his fields. And that's what we're doing in the kingdom of God today, in the kingdom of heaven today. And every member of the church is important to the function of the church. Every member of the church is important to the function of the church. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. I, I, feel like we, I feel like we could just focus on this passage tonight and just deal with this, and, and we would get a real good idea of what this lesson's about. The lesson, it, the title of it is Serving by Involving Others. And that's what the idea of this is. We know that we're supposed to serve, but we need to learn to involve others in what we're doing. We need to learn that everybody can have a part to play in this, uh, in this work we're doing. Beginning in verse 12 of chapter 12, he says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, am I not the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now...
them to be. All right, he puts them where he wants them to be. He puts what where he wants them to be? In that part of the body. The members. Which members? All the members of the body. <laughs> I want us to be careful here. Look at the verse preceding that. He says, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Now we know that as he's going through this, that he's using this idea of the physical body as a metaphor. All right? In verse 18, is God saying that he puts my eyes where they're supposed to be and my feet where they're supposed to be? Or is he saying that I put you in that position where I want you to be and I put you in that position where, you, where I want you to be? I want you to be careful about that. I want you to be careful about that. Um, I tend to lean more the other way, and I'll tell you why as we go through this lesson. I have learned over the years, has God given each other certain talents? Yes. And we don't all have the same, same talents. But I have seen people who didn't have the talent, who have taken up a role, and they have learned to fill that role, even though God didn't seem to give them the natural talent. So I want us to be careful with this idea that God puts you in those specific roles. God has specific roles to fill. He has a purpose for his church. And he is expecting us to fill those roles. He is expecting us to take up those torches or whatever, however metaphors you want to use to see that. He's expecting us to do the things that he has prescribed. And as we go through here, we're going to see some of those things and see maybe how each one of us could feel some of those things. And there are definitely some things that not everyone can feel, uh, but we'll, we'll see that as we go along. All right, so first of all, what we've got to understand is people must be involved. We need to be involved in the Lord's church. A high unemployment rate negatively affects the ability to get work done. Why? Nothing gets done if no one works. No one, nothing gets done if nobody works. Uh, I, I put this statistic in there because I thought it was interesting. Currently, the unemployment rate is 3.6% in Tennessee. Right now. The unemployment rate. Now, is that a high number or a low number? That's a low number, isn't it? That seems to indicate that, that most everybody that wants a job gets a job, right? There's a key word that I just said in there. Wants. That statistic does not count or measure those who do who are not looking for work. Right? does not include really You know, I was thinking maybe that was a little bit dead. Yeah, it's just a little bit. Well, okay. come down here and get some back. All right. We'll see if that works a little bit better. He'll give me some batteries for that lapel in a minute. So when we think about that number, um, those, those online who maybe not didn't hear because I was dead, um, the unemployment rate in Tennessee was 3.6%. That's a low number, seems like, but like I said, that does not include all the people who do not want to work. It does not include all the people who are retired. It does not include people who are too young to work. You know, there's, there's a large number of people that that just does not include. And so you, you've got to think about that as far as that number is concerned. Oh, it's some green ones. It's some green ones right here. Just take that. Right, well, don't worry about bringing them. I'll just stay right here. How about that? I'll just stay right here. Maybe, if you're lucky. All right. So when we consider that number, all right, think about this. That's a low number for Tennessee. I think it's like 3.1 for the, for the whole country right now, which it seems low, but what about all of those people who could be doing something? All right, let's focus on the church. 
what is the unemployment rate in the kingdom of heaven, in the church? Anybody know? Anybody want to guess? Oh, no, I was going with the fact that I didn't know, and I was hoping somebody else did. That's what, that's what I was hoping for. <laughs> yes, that, that was a trick question, Timothy. Yeah, I, don't, I don't really know. I know it has been said that 80% of the work that's done in the church is done by 20% of the people. I, I, I have heard you know, statistics like that being said. What should be the unemployment rate in the kingdom? Zero. It ought to be zero. Every member of the Lord's church ought to be doing something. And there's different reasons why, but many just do not do anything in the Lord's church. And, and of course, I'm, I mean, we can come up with legitimate reasons, seemingly legitimate reasons, you know, health and age and things like that, either young or old or whatever. But... Whatever the reasons are, there is something that everyone can do. There's something that you can help with. There is plenty of work to be done. It is not a shortage of necessity. There's plenty of work to be done. The Lord has given us tasks to be done, and, and there's, well, we're going we're gonna to go through some of those in the next point, but but the idea is there's so much work to be done, those spots will never be completely filled. We need to understand that. There is so much work in the Lord's church to be done that you will never get it all done. But what are we supposed to do? Keep working. Keep trying at it. When we think about the, the work of the church, and I, I think about the, you know, the Great Commission where he says go into all the world you know, and, and, uh, and make disciples of, well, see, I'm getting them mixed up. Mark 16, 16, go into all the world and, and uh, preach the gospel to every creature. That seems huge. Go, go and preach to every creature? How do we get that done? Work it. Yeah. You're not going to get done sitting around wondering how you're going to get it done. You're going to get done by getting up and getting at it, right? I love the phrase, many hands make light work. Every year, or at least the past couple of years, I don't even remember what, you know, past, past last year I don't remember, so I can say every year. Every year at camp, we've been doing some sort of water sport with water balloons, and the kids absolutely love it. Past couple of years, we've done a water balloon battleship where we have hung up curtains on the volleyball court, and they, and they have to sit in chairs and lob them water balloons back and forth, and they have a ball at that. The only problem with all that is when you're done, you got all these little pieces of plastic balloon everywhere. Well, all that's got to be picked up. We, we can't leave that you know, on the volleyball court. And so we put them all to it. Many hands make light work. It doesn't take just a few minutes, and they've got it all cleaned up. It's the same way with, with the kingdom. If we would all get at the work, if we would all do the work of the kingdom, it's not that big of a task. We're, we're supposed to always be growing, always be growing. And even, like you say, even if we're just staying steady, 
we're not really doing what God wanted us to do. We, we need to be steadily growing, increasing our skills and working those things, and we'll see some of that as we go along, but, but we, we've got to keep adding to, keep adding to. All right, that's, that's good. God said, yeah, guy said that, uh, that he, he couldn't quit working because God never retired on him, you know. Uh, and that's the idea that we ought to have in the Lord's kingdom. Um, well, all right, let's, let's move on here. Number three there under that section, there is no shortage of work to be done, but there is a shortage of workers. There is a shortage of workers. Now, when we think about... Uh, working in the kingdom, and we're going to talk a little more about this later, you know, my mind always goes to those who are preaching, those who are, you know, f- filling pulpits and things like that, and, and I hate to tell you this, but we are sorely lacking in preachers in the Lord's church. Sorely lacking. There are just not enough men out there to fulfill the pulpits that are open. Uh, and we really need to encourage that in our young people. We need to encourage that. I didn't get a whole lot of encouragement on that as I was growing up. I got, you're going to do this. Yeah, that's what I got, all right? Uh, and that doesn't work on everybody, okay? I'm not suggesting we just absolutely go whole hog, whole hog at that. But, uh, but we need to encourage our young people. Uh, there are roles to be filled, and they need to be working to fill those. Retirement is not an excuse in the kingdom of God. Who doesn't quit? Okay, God doesn't quit, but that wasn't who I put in the blank. Satan doesn't quit. Satan doesn't quit. And as long as we've got breath in us, we ought to be doing something. Now, like I say, the role may change as we get older. You know, we're not able to do the same things we're able to do as we're younger. So, so those roles are going to change as you go. But we ought to always be doing something in the Lord's church. Um, I had a cousin uh, back home that uh, she, she was not mentally able to do a whole lot. Uh, but what she could do was she could send cards to everybody whenever their birthday came around. And, and it, if you didn't receive a card from her, she, she just didn't know you exist. Because if she knew about you and she knew your birthday, you're getting a card. And that's the bottom line. And that's about all she could do. I mean, she would come to church, you know, different things like that. But she found something she could do, and she did it. And she did it consistently. Letter B there under number three, youth is not an excuse not to serve. Youth is not an excuse. Youth, young people. Yeah, youngins, there you go. If you want to write youngins in there, that'd be all right. What, what do we expect out of young people when they become Christians? I, I have to really think about this at camp because the environment that we have at camp, it makes it really easy for young people to decide to obey the gospel. And any time these young people come to me and say, I want to be baptized, we don't just go straight to the pool. We sit down and we do some study, and I want to know what's in your mind. I want to know what's in your heart. I want to know if you actually mean this or, you know, if this is just because my buddy over here got baptized, you know. Uh, and so we, we kind of run them through the ringer a little bit more than what we might an adult. But there's good reason behind that. When you decide that you are going to be a Christian, you are deciding to follow God. You're deciding to follow Jesus Christ. And that means you are deciding that you are ready to work in his kingdom. So why don't we put them to work? 
Oh, great. My tablet just died. <laughs> How about that? Marie, would you get me one of those lesson sheets back there? Oh, ne no, never mind. I'll just use my phone. Fancy technologies. If it dies, we're in trouble. <laughs> I tell you what, I, the past couple of weeks... We, we had an issue at home with the computer printer not printing from my laptop, and so I got out of the habit of printing my lessons, and I'd just been using my tablet, and I knew that was a mistake. I knew that was a mistake. All right, let me see if I can get this pulled up here. Sorry for the interruption there. All right. We were talking about young people. Oftentimes, whenever young people are baptized in the Lord's church, it's like, no, you can't use them for this. No, you can't use them for that. You know, uh, my thoughts is why or why not? Now, yes, there are some areas where they can. I mean, they're just not, they don't have that ability yet. But I I'll tell you what somebody told me several years ago. If you want somebody to be faithful in the Lord's church, put them to work. Put them to work. And we've got to especially pay attention to our young people, that we are putting them to work in some capacity. I know Vacation Bible School is a great way to utilize the young people, helping decorate and all of these things. Let them, let them have a stake in what we're doing here. Uh, show them how they can serve. I, I grew up with the mentality that I, I want to be available to do whatever I'm asked to do. Now, what's wrong with that mentality? Waiting to be asked. That's right. But when you're young, that's what you do. You know, you wait to be asked. Uh, maybe there is an occasion where you might speak up and say, hey, can we do such and such, you know? But for young people, that's few and far between where you think that that's a comfortable thing to do. And so we, and the next section here where uh, uh, people must know how to serve, that's kind of what that's about, is helping others learn where they can serve. Uh, one, number one there under that uh, section, one reason for Christian unemployment is not knowing where to serve. One reason is not knowing where to serve. And you think about a young Christian coming into the church, just been baptized, they don't know what to do. They don't know, you know, and, and maybe they've come from a, a background that is not church. Maybe they haven't had any church in it all. You know, they don't have a clue. And so we've got to help them. We've got to work with them and, and train them into some things. Uh, letter A there, many have the mind as what I was saying a while ago, that teaching and preaching are the main ways to serve. Many have the mind that teaching and preaching are the main ways to serve. How many hours are in a week? How many hours are in a week? 24 times 7 is 168. 168 hours in a week. How many of those hours, and whenever I say teaching and preaching, I'm talking about, you know, congregationally, publicly, that sort of thing. How many of those hours of the 168 are taken up by teaching and preaching? Generally four hours. That leaves 164 hours. Probably going to get some sleep in there somewhere. Maybe. <laughs> But uh, I, there's a lot of hours to fill, isn't there? There's a lot of hours to fill with the Lord's work. Uh, only a few are going to be able to be capable of filling those teaching and preaching positions. And so it's going to be up to all of us to fill up those other hours. Even when those four, within those four hours... Uh, there are ways that each and every person can serve. I want you to think about this. When you come to worship, oh, i got to stay over here, don't I? When you come to worship, 
Are you serving when you sit in those pews? Yes. I, I need you to understand, yes, you are serving when you are filling up that space in that pew. How is that serving? You're encouraging others. Let me tell you, it is, it is extremely encouraging to get up in the pulpit and see there's not a whole lot of blank spaces out there. Or at least, you know, it's pretty well full. That is an encouragement to any preacher to be able to see that. It is an encouragement to other members to see that there are so many who are coming and filling the pews. Uh, and I'm not saying, we're kind of scattered out here on Wednesday nights a lot of times. You know, we're, we've got a lot of empty spaces. But the ones who are here, you are an encouragement. You're an encouragement to me, you're an encouragement to one another, and I, and I know you enjoy one another's company because I can't get you out of here by evening, so. which is great. Love it. Doesn't matter where we've been through the years, it seems like we, we're the one, last ones out the door. Uh, we go on vacation, wherever, we're always talking until everybody else is gone. And so I, I love that. I love to see that. All right, letter B there, God's word gives us what we need for every good work. Every good work. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. I should be able to quote that, but I ain't going to trust myself tonight. So. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, if he gives us his word that thoroughly equips us for every good word, then what do we need to do with that word? Spread it. What do you got to do before you spread it? You got to study it. You got to read it. He's, he's given us the instructions... He's told us what to do, and it's up to us to get into the, into the Word and to learn, okay, what are the things that you want us to do? And then we can take that from there and we can say, okay, how can I feel that? How can I fulfill what I've been commanded to do? He's given us what we need for our spiritual service in His kingdom. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, as His divine power has given to us all things through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. There's more to that verse. But it, the idea is we, everything that we need in our spiritual life is given through the knowledge of Christ. Given through his, you know, what he has given to us. And so we need to be involved in knowing what those things are. Did I not have number? I skipped number two in that section. You see that? I didn't highlight it right. Various talents. We're going to turn over to Romans chapter 12. Various talents are given to different people to fill the many positions available. And I want us to look at, at Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 3 through 8. Uh, we ain't going to make it, are we? Okay. We'll see, R.L. went out the door, so I know that I'm almost done, whether I want to be or not. Beginning in verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who has, shows mercy with cheerfulness. Not everyone is capable of doing everything. Not everyone is capable of doing everything. 
But God, in, in this passage here, has given us seven, dip, seven different areas where we can serve. And within those seven different, different areas, there are many different ways that you can go about fulfilling those things. And we can do this. We can get together and we can do these things. Uh, not all can teach. James chapter 3, verse 1. You know, he says, not, don't let... Don't let all of you be teachers. Or ex- I don't remember exactly how it says that. But not all can be elders. You look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, uh, Titus chapter 1, where he gives qualifications for elders. That means that there's only a, you know, there's a certain group that can do that. Not all can be deacons, 1 Timothy chapter 3. But all can serve in these different areas. Just maybe not in the specific way that those would do. In those areas that Paul listed here, and, I, and I, on letter B there, Paul listed seven different areas of service. In those areas, there's a lot of different ways to serve. And since, since there are listed jobs to do, we need to be about figuring out how we can do those jobs. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, these seven. But because the Bible tells us, look, these are the things that you ought to be doing, then we need to be seeing how we can do those things. Number three, Christians need to look for jobs, and they need to be helped in finding jobs. Leaders and members must help members find something to do. Um, One of the things that I can remember whenever I was younger was having um, um, was training. It was training you know, how to serve in the Lord's, Lord's church, you know, how to serve in worship, uh, you know, serve in the Lord's Supper and, and saying prayers and reading scriptures and things like that. And we had those trainings. And I remember when we had those trainings that all of the young people and some of the older ones even would come to those trainings. And then I remember us trying to do that whenever I was a little bit older. And there wasn't as many come. And then as a deacon, we tried to do it again. It wasn't hardly nobody come. It is up to leaders and you members to help one another to find those roles to fill. But there is a responsibility on you as members to look for those jobs look for those roles, look for those things that can be done. Uh, Letter B there, members need to be looking for jobs that serve and edify the church. If we look over to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16, he talks about there how from, from from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causing growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Are Christians supposed to teach the lost how to be saved? Doesn't the Bible say something about that? I I believe the Bible says something about that. Does it matter how old you are in regards to whether you can do that? If you're a Christian, you know what to do to be saved because you've read it, you've understood it, you've obeyed it. And therefore, and you might have to do a little studying to make sure that you understand it, but therefore you can tell somebody else how to do the same thing that you did. We can tell people what to do to be lost. What about restoring someone who has strayed away? Helping somebody to come back, encouraging them to come back to the assembly. Is that something that all of us can do? Yeah. What about encouraging the weak or those who are discouraged? Can we help them out in that? I think so. Comforting those who are dealing with sorrow. You know, not, you know, not everybody really can do that very well, okay? I'm here to tell you that it takes special people to do that, but some of y'all are special, Okay? <laughs> And you do really well at that, and I appreciate that. Encourage or support support those who are teaching and preaching publicly. Can you do that? 
words of encouragement, financial encouragement, you know, however you want to look at that, supporting those who are doing those things, helping others bear their burdens, Galatians 6, verse 2. We're supposed to help each other bear burdens. How can we help each other bear, bear each other's burdens? Hmm? Listening, yeah, sometimes that's all it takes, just listen. What else? Praying, absolutely praying is, is a good way. What is it that James says? If you see somebody in need and you tell them, depart in peace, you know, I don't remember exactly how he says that, but basically he's saying, I'm praying for you. What good does that do? It don't do anything if you don't help them. If we have the ability to help someone, and I'm talking about financially or whatever it is, if we have the ability to help someone, we need to be helping them whenever they are burdened with those things. And all of us are capable in some way of helping others bear their burdens. There's work to do. There is work on every hand. Hark the cry for help comes ringing through the land. Isn't that a song? that we sing. We need to be about doing these things. All right, real quick, and I know that I'm way past time, but people need motivation. We want to feel satisfaction for the work that we do, don't we? I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. We want, we want to have... I, I hate having an unfinished job. Marie would say I don't hate it enough, but... <laughs> But when you finish a job, when you get it completed, whatever it is, you know, it just gives you that sense of satisfaction that you can, uh, you know, you can take away from that. A recent study says that 57% of those who quit, quit their jobs, feel they are not respected. Now, the idea in that is some of them are disrespected, but some of them just don't feel like they're appreciated. You know, a lot of people, they'll go somewhere else if they don't feel like they're appreciated. We need to show one another, motivate one another, tell each, each other how much we appreciate what you do. We need to be doing that. Paul motivated the Romans by reminding them their talents are a gift from God. Everything that we do, everything we're capable of doing is a gift from God given by the grace of God. Of God. And we need to remember that. We need to use those talents. Don't allow those talents to go by the wayside. And not only do we need to use them, we need to improve on them. We need to hone them. I was studying this afternoon with somebody and I told him, I said, you may not believe this, but I grew up as the kid that you didn't know was there. I sat in the back of the room you, you didn't hear nothing out of me. I was quiet, stayed out of trouble, you know, didn't really speak up in class or anything like that. I just wanted to get it done and, and, and get on my way. You can improve. You can work on that. I think I've improved a little bit on that maybe over the years. I can tell you this, Marie has far outdone me. Talking to people out in the community, Inviting them to church? I'm not good at that. Marie is. Blows my mind. Because I know where she came from. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Your work will not be in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Your work will not be in vain. What are we working for? Who are we working for? Working for God. We're working to give him the glory, 2 Peter chapter 4, or I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, talks about that. You know, if you speak, speak as the oracles of God. He, he talks about giving him the glory in all things. That's what we're supposed to be about. We're supposed to be about giving God the glory in all that we do. Each and every one of us, even you young people, even you young people, have a place in the Lord's church where you can serve, things that you can do to build up the church, to edify, to spread the gospel, 
tell others about Christ. We don't need to think that we can just sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Let's encourage one another. If you see somebody looking for something to do, see if you can't find something for them to do. We need to be working on that as a congregation. I'm going to turn over to Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah 13. What's our song of invitation, Gary? 125. Number 125, if you're using a songbook, it'll be on the overhead. When you think about, um, uh, I hate to bring up politics, but you, you, you think about politicians, all right? You, you think about those races, you know, where they're running, they're trying to get elected, and, and what do they always do? Always giving promises. This is what I'm going to do whenever I get in, in office, you know. Sometimes you come across a politician who in the past, this has been their mindset, but now all of a sudden since they're running for this particular office, their, their views have changed. They've flip-flopped, you know. And, and they'll, they'll get asked them questions, you know, why, are, why have you changed your mind now, you know. And they'll, they'll give reasons, all, you know, all those different things like that. I want to read you a verse that maybe teaches us a little something, not just politicians, but all people. In Jeremiah 13, verse 23, Jeremiah says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Now the context in which he puts that is he is talking to the children of Israel who have spent a lifetime doing evil. They have been serving and worshiping these false gods, and here they, and they're, they're trying to come around and say, oh, we've changed. And Jer God saying through Jeremiah said, no, no, you ain't changed. Said, Can an Ethiopian change his skin color? Can a leopard change his spots? And of course, that's a silly question. No, they can't. But the idea there, then may you also do good who are accustomed to doing evil. And I think about those people in the world today who upon hearing the gospel have changed. They have changed. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Looking at verses 9 through 11, where Paul writes, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, whenever you look at that list of sins, young people, when you look at that list of sins, that's some pretty, pretty serious stuff, isn't it? I mean, murderers? Uh, those are serious things we're talking about. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So what is the difference? What is the difference in those Israelites whom God said, you can't change, you've been evil too long. And then people who today hear the gospel and they just change just like that. Now not everybody does, and I understand that. Some have a lot that they've got to come up out of, but I've seen it happen. I have seen people change at that moment. So what has really changed? What has really been different in their lives that has helped them to do that? I don't have a verse for you. I know you could probably throw a verse at me. I didn't have time to look for this. But it's the idea of the heart being changed. You see, because that's where these things come from. That's where these sins come from. It comes from the heart. It comes from the things that we want in our lives. 
Over the years, I have known people who have tried to quit smoking, and I've known some of them who have tried for years, and they have never been able to get over the habit. And I have also known people who have decided to quit one day, and then they have never smoked another cigarette again. What's the difference? It's the heart. It's in the heart. Do you truly desire to change? That's what we're looking for. Now, as I said, it doesn't always, it's not always an immediate change. Sometimes there's some things that we've got to work through, don't we? There's some things that we've got to deal with from our past. But we can deal with it. We can get over it with the help of God. If He'll help us through those things, and He says He will, if you'll turn to Him, if you'll let Him help you. This evening, if you are not a member of the Lord's Church, I would encourage you to. I would encourage you to make that change tonight. Put on the Lord in baptism. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, if you're ready to repent, now there's the, there's the pivoting point right there. Repentance is changing your mind, the, the heart. Okay? It's this heart up here. There we go. Like, like, uh, like Brother Rogers does. You know, you've got to change the heart. If you will change your mind, change your heart, confess Him as Lord, then you can be buried with Him in baptism where you'll come in contact with His blood and it will take away all your sins. It'll cover those sins so that when God looks at you, He'll not see those sins anymore. If you're ready to do that tonight, we are ready to assist you in that. If you have done those things, but maybe there is something wrong in your life that, that is keeping you from serving like you ought to serve, can we help you with that? If you just need prayers of encouragement, if you need to confess some wrong, whatever it might be, I would encourage you to take